Welcome back to the City Current Show. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We're always honored to bring you inspiring stories of individuals and organizations making a difference, empowering the good. And in this case, we're talking about hope for justice. We're honored to have with us Sarah Butler, United States Program Director at Hope for Justice, and also Christy Tagg, Chief Development Officer. How are you two doing? Great, thank you, happy to be here. Wonderful, thrilled to be here. Thank you for having us. Absolutely, you all do a tremendous amount to power the good. So we're gonna talk about human trafficking and a lot of the tragedies that unfold but also the good that you're doing to help bring justice and restore lives and create transformation all to power the good. So let's start out with a little bit of context. Sarah, give us some background, a little bit of history for Hope for Justice. Absolutely. So Hope for Justice was founded in the UK in 2008. Um, We are an anti-trafficking charity that's international. So we work across five continents. We run on four pillars, prevent, rescue, restore, and reform. It's really important to us to provide holistic support for survivors of trafficking uh, globally. And uh, one of the best ways that we do that is by providing both investigation, safe housing, training for law enforcement and the community. Um, And we also um, throw events and uh, do a lot in the sort of um, education sphere. And we'll definitely talk about ways the community can get involved. And I know, Christy, that's your area of focus for sure. We'll talk all about that. Let's dive into your world, Sarah, because, you know, for you covering, you know, national with the United States, but then talking a lot about what's going on in Tennessee, give us a little bit of your vantage point, your world. So talk about kind of your world on your end. Absolutely. So, Jeremy, before I was in this position, I was actually an assistant district attorney here in Nashville, Tennessee, um, and I handled all of the human trafficking cases for my office. So I come from sort of a boots on the ground view of what human trafficking looks like in Tennessee. And I can tell you, it is a real problem and it's really happening here in our state. Um, I moved to Hope for Justice because of the incredible work that they do to actually change the landscape for trafficking survivors. Um, So rather than kind of the retroactive prosecution end, I'm now involved on sort of the proactive side. So Hope for Justice, we do have investigators in Tennessee, Iowa, North Carolina, but we do cover a bigger global geography than that. But just for a focus here in Tennessee to kind of give people a picture of what's been going on here, Just last year, Hope for Justice in Tennessee only had 10 victim recoveries, 12 assisted recoveries, 73 referrals, 30 new cases, and 2,741 individuals trained just in the state of Tennessee. So those numbers for one state are huge. Dive into your world even deeper in terms of defining trafficking, because I think People hear the word, but they don't necessarily realize how pervasive and even with families and things like that of what's going on. So how do you define trafficking and, you know, talk about it from that lens? Sure. And that's really, really important because a lot of times when people hear the word trafficking, what they assume is a picture of somebody who's been either forcefully kidnapped or is being forcefully held, you know, handcuffed in a basement somewhere. Um, And while that is sometimes the the story that we see, especially globally, often here in the United States, trafficking does look a little different. So the legal definition of trafficking is commercial sex via force, fraud, or coercion. And force, fraud, and coercion can look a lot of different ways. So for example, here in Tennessee, in our criminal statute, using drugs as a method of coercion actually constitutes trafficking. So one of the big things we see here is traffickers prey on people who have existing vulnerabilities. Traffickers prey on people who either maybe are runaway youth, that's a huge thing that we see here, youth involved in the foster system, unstable family and home lives, um, drug addiction, either prior or they've been made to be addicted by their trafficker, uh, mental health issues, things like that. And so a lot of what we see here in Tennessee and here in the States um, are vulnerable populations that are preyed upon by traffickers and end up in a situation that they do not feel safe to leave. Now, that doesn't always look 
the way that people would think. Sometimes a trafficking survivor will have had access to a cell phone the whole time, um, but they won't use it uh, because that force fraud or coercion element that they're suffering through is so pervasive that they, they don't feel that they can safely seek a way out. What's so wonderful about Hope for Justice is that our investigators are really skilled um, to help locate and extract and restore survivors where they are re- when, it, when it's really needed. How do the referrals come in? How, how, where does it start with you all? So we have a number of ways that we get, we get referrals to our investigators. Obviously, we do have a website, but we also work with local law enforcement. Um, we do also get a lot of referrals just from the community. And part of that is why it's so important that we are very present in the communities that we serve. We want people to know that we're here so that they feel comfortable actually reaching out directly to a Hope for Justice investigator or to our information system so that we can get referrals that way. Um, And then obviously another way that we get referrals is via family members, et cetera, of kind of at risk people who they think may be in a trafficking situation or our investigators, like I said, are really skilled at tracing um, those people to to where they are and potentially getting them into a safe place. You mentioned the training stats. Talk about the training on your end and give us maybe a few things when you talk about training, what does the public need to be more mindful of in, in terms of recommendations and what we need to be looking for to help Talk about training and what we can do to help. (laughs) Give us some tips. So our investigators do a good amount of our training. Our investigators train law enforcement. Um, They also train in the community. And they most recently actually trained the DEA in New York, which is pretty incredible. Um, But we also do have a training specialist in North Carolina. um, And we do have a lot of online learning. So we do have the Hope for Justice Academy online that people can access. Um, What's so important when you're talking about educating the community about trafficking is that people are aware of a little bit of what we've already talked about, sort of what trafficking looks like in your locale. So it can look different everywhere. Um, Some of the signs we often talk about when we're talking about kind of spotting red flags for human trafficking. When I was a prosecutor and I used to do trainings, I used to say, I kind of hate to, to get into that because I don't want people to be alarmist, but I also I don't want to give a list and then people think that that's sort of an exhaustive list, but, you know, there are a couple of things to look out for. Like I said, at risk youth and vulnerable populations, um, somebody who maybe doesn't have their own form of identification. It's really important that we're training hotel and motel industry, as well as the medical kind of industry, those are people who are on the front lines who will probably encounter a survivor at some point. Carry that into changing the laws. I think that's another big piece of what you all are doing. So talk about some of that activism on you know, the legal side for this. Absolutely. And that's sort of uh, something that I'm really passionate about. I think that changing kind of legislation is the best way to make a sustainable impact on the landscape for survivors. Um, Part of that is going to be on the federal level and part of that is going to be on the state level. Hope for Justice has been very involved in numerous pieces of federal legislation that are really pivotal for survivors. Um, So the um, uh, Trafficking Victims Protection Act, uh, there's a, a new bill that's going through that will allow for, or we hope that will go through that will allow for expungement of records for survivors of trafficking. And I'll explain a little bit about why this is so important. Now, obviously it's important that we also have harsh penalties for traffickers and that's an area that Hope for Justice is also interested in getting involved in legislatively and something that I'm looking at forward thinking for our US programming. But when we talk about legislation that's really impactful in the trafficking sphere, what we really wanna talk about is how we can support survivors to decrease their vulnerability and decrease the opportunity for kind of recidivism into trafficking. And having a criminal record is a huge vulnerability that a lot of trafficking survivors have. Once you have a criminal record, it's really hard to get gainful employment and safe housing on your own. So Hope for Justice has taken a position that it's really important for us to get involved in legislation that actively helps to protect and enhance the lives of survivors. 
before we switch over to Christy and talk about all the ways the community can support your efforts, two quick things. One is give me one more thing that you wish everyone knew about Hope for Justice. Hope for Justice is such an incredible organization globally, um, but here in America, in the United States, what I really want people to understand is that our investigators are such an asset. I know there can oftentimes be sort of fear or trepidation, especially from local law enforcement uh, about working with nonprofit investigators. And I really want everybody in the community, including law enforcement, including prosecutors' offices to know that our investigators are well-trained. They are here as a gap filler, as an asset, and as a way to assist, but not to, you know, overstep. Um, but what I really want people to understand about Hope for Justice is all of the impact that we can make in our community is with the help of our community. So we really are just hoping that people will get involved with us and see all the great things that we're doing. Yeah. And last question, and then we'll switch over and talk about community engagement is, what makes you hopeful for the future? Obviously, we still have a long way to go with this in terms of the issues of trafficking and such, but what makes you hopeful for the future? There's so many great things on the horizon, both in terms of legislation and just the attention that this issue is getting now in the United States. Even five years ago, uh, there just wasn't an understanding of the fact that human trafficking was happening here. Um, it was always considered sort of a global issue and not in our backyard. So over the last five and, or 10 years or so, there has been so much incredible attention given to human trafficking here in the United States. So I am just seeing all of that momentum continue. So I'm very hopeful for the future about what that looks like for both nonprofits, law enforcement, um, and just the survivor landscape as a whole. Absolutely. So let's switch over, Christy. Let's talk about the many ways the community can support your efforts. And so you've got events, opportunities. Go ahead and uh, start painting the picture of how the community can help Hope for Justice. Absolutely. You know, one of our goals is to end human trafficking in our lifetime. Um, and we firmly believe that we can do that, but we can't do that alone. So we need the help of uh, this community uh, of Tennessee, which is, um, you know, very giving, um, but around the world as well. Um, but what's happening here in Tennessee? Um, you know, we actually have right before Valentine's Day on the 13th, uh, events at Kendra Scott, uh, in-store events um, in Nashville. So if you come in and um, you're able to buy anything, 20% goes to us. We'll have uh, our booths there where you can talk to us, where you can um, uh, sign up for things, to get newsletters, to, to give more. Um, you'll get to meet me. Actually, I'll be there and, and some of our other staff. So um, that is one way. Um, another way is to become a guardian or a monthly donor. These are really what we would call our sustainers, um, you know, the foundation of, of what makes us be able to do what Sarah talked about. Um, someone has to fund that. Um, and, and that's what um, we ask the community to help us do. And the way you can do that is to go to hopeforjustice.org backslash donate. Um, so that's hopeforjustice.org backslash donate um, and become a monthly donor at any amount, whatever amount it fits your budget. You can also reach out to me, Christy Tag. I'm the chief development officer. And what I love to do is work with companies, work with individuals uh, to create bespoke ways that you can support the fight for freedom. That does mean funding, but it also means volunteer engagement. And I know a lot of people want to volunteer and a lot of companies want their employees to volunteer. So what you can do is reach out to me via email. Uh, my email is christy.tag at hopeforjustice.org. And that's K-R-I-S-T-I-E dot T-A-G-G -G at hopeforjustice.org. There's so many ways when you talk about events and the customization, the volunteerism, and like you said, the monthly, um, the, the monthly recurring opportunities to fund the fight for freedom, which is immensely important. Give me one more way that the community can plug in. Absolutely. Um, 
We love cyclists. We have a, an event called Break the Cycle. It's in Iowa. It's here in Nashville. It's in Dallas. It is um, an event where we're able to bring together cyclists that love to cycle. Um, it's a 100 or 200 mile cycling event that happens every September in Nashville for cycling enthusiasts. And what we love about that is that um, we'll have cyclists come, they raise funds for Hope for Justice. There's a pasta dinner the night before. Um, you get to meet fellow cyclists in the community. Um, we have some cyclist leaders. We have some, um, George Hincapi, who was a, um, a constituent of Neil Armstrong is now getting involved with us. So um, just some really fun things happening with Break the Cycle um, that we know that cyclists would want to get involved with us this year. Absolutely. So the website again is hopeforjustice.org. So hopeforjustice.org. And uh, absolutely amazing, Sarah, Christy, everything that you and your amazing team are doing. So thank you for all you do. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank oh, you, we Jeremy. appreciate you. Thank you so much, Jeremy.